Hi, I'm Eleni Sotos with the New Economy Funders Network. Um, really, really terrific across the board. In fact, all the presentations today have been really rock stars, so I just want to say that. But um, what's really curious to me is, you know, this concept of equity, um, I'm really curious about in cities, there are really class divides that we don't talk about as much in this country, along with race and socioeconomic. Um, and, and a lot of this stuff that I've seen is that people who want to or are able to participate are, are middle or upper middle class, like the sharing stuff. And I'm just wondering what progress has been made in lower income or communities of color that are, or working class communities. Are these more difficult? On one level, logically, you think that it's actually more appealing because it's sharing of existing resources and so forth. But it also seems to me like there's a boutique quality to a lot of the work that goes on in this arena. Like I live in Berkeley and you know, there's a crop share, a crop share thing. And I'm like, that assumes that you own a home basically and that you have lemon trees in your yard. So that cuts out like most of the people in Berkeley except for, you know, few people. So I'm just curious about how you've, how's that, How's that actually playing out as you work on your plans in the city? And because you said in the West Hills, they want to rent, right? So there's, there's some really interesting um, assumptions in there. So I'd love to hear a little bit about that. Yeah, that, that is um, a key question. And, and um, I think that it's, it's a lot about the place-based stuff that I was talking about. We are not going to be able to have a citywide campaign unless we're re really working with the communities right at the neighborhood level um, and, and so that they're defining um, for themselves what their resources are. Um, our, our testing over and over showed that um, where you live and who you communicate with will really change how you're going to decide to share and how you're going to decide to fix and maintain something. Um, and so the campaign needs to be both place-based and, and this transition piece and some communities don't communicate, or they're not communities of place. They're communities um, connected by ethnicity or religion. And so we also need to be in those places um, and understanding what their resources are, where their resources are not. And that's what, one of the slides I was um, had to skip through, is that we're really looking for where are the gaps in the community where they just don't have any resources, um, and how do we fill those without just putting some kind of something that works in another community and not that community. And we'll have to be in the relationships in those communities in order to do it. That's, it's the only way. They have to define it. I'm Mackenzie Jones with uh, City of Flagstaff, Arizona. And actually, first, I just want to thank Portland because uh, we stole your Be Resourceful campaign and actually call it that <laughs> outright and the whole website and everything. Yeah. So, so we really appreciate it. Thank you for that. Um, but along those lines, just to sort of expand on, on the question that you just asked, um, are there specific messages that work well with uh, the low-income communities along those ideas? Um, because we have, uh, we don't necessarily have the, we don't take for granted that people are on board with recycling. There's a good portion of, of Flagstaff that isn't. Um, and so that's not just a sort of automatic buy-in for us, but, but we actually probably have more sharing and, and um, fixing and all these different elements than we do just even recycling in our lower income communities. But I'm trying to figure out just how we can access that more and tap into it more. I thought that the concept of the transitional periods was really interesting. So. Um, our research was showing that across the board in Portland at any rate, um, the, the, the just focusing on reuse, fix and maintain, borrow and share um, resonated for just about everybody. Um, but the sense of who had access to how to do it was very different in Portland. And, um, and so um, we definitely found that lower income, um, lower education communities especially feel like they don't have access to those resources to do it. Um, and so whether it's really there, I would say that they're, as you say, they may be actually more resourceful, but we're not naming it in a way that they're, they're recognizing it. So we need to, to see where that disconnect is. Um, but we're also really having a conversation about that in our offices to whether we need to, we should even be spending a lot of time finding messaging to the low income communities, because they're not actually the folks that are the problem. Um, they're not the consumers, um, so why, why, <laughs> why, 
why ask them to do something they're not doing? Um, you know, um, so what one community that we are finding that, that we may be really focusing on is finding messages um, for up and coming and professional communities of color. Uh, research is really showing that, that climate messages resonate more in that community and they are just starting to go, oh, I'm making it, I'm gonna start consuming. It's a moment of transition for them to be thinking differently about um, how they consume. So that, that may be an area that, that we're gonna do some testing around messages and thanks. We've got Philip, Tom, and Vanessa. Yeah. <coughs> Philip, uh, thank you for your presentations. I have a specific question for David. Uh, about your collaboration with the Homeowners Association. Can you expand a little bit on it? And what went well and what were the problems there and what are the results? Sure, um, so it, when we first proposed work on house size through the um, waste prevention strategy, it, the Home Builders Association came, uh, they were very upset and it really slowed us down um, quite a bit. And then when we eventually decided to move forward with a project to evaluate the environmental impacts of different types of waste prevention strategies, because you know waste prevention, it's in the law and we want to do the, get the best bang for the buck, we put out an RFP and we ended up getting a proposal from a really good life cycle analysis research firm with the Home Builders Association as a subcontractor. So we hired them, you know, to sort of embrace each other and sing kumbaya, and they did this research that had their name on it that ended up saying that the most important thing we could do from an environmental perspective was small houses. And then the recession hit. And the home builders, um, now focusing specifically in the case of Portland, the home builders were desperate for any work. And the city, this is really the city's idea, not DEQ, came up with this, this fee waiver on accessory dwelling units in part as a way to goose construction activity and employment. Um, at a time when there was very little. Um, and so it was really a, for, a fortuitous timing, essentially, um, that, that, helped, that, that caused us for several years to, to hold hands and, and sing the same tune. Yeah, more or less, you know. Um, and, and, and the home builders, they, they'll push back when we talk about small houses. They say, you know, not everyone wants a small house. And we say, yeah, we agree. We're, we're, we're fine with that. But the point is, is that if you're going to have an inv a program that is around environment and reducing, you know, like like a green building certification program. The greenest house is the smaller is the smaller one, and we need to acknowledge that. And if you're going to reward points or give incentives or something for green houses, you ought to recognize what's really green, which is just as important or more so than having compact fluorescent light bulbs and all that other stuff. And for us, the small the small house thing is really interesting because it's this wonderful intersection of the high impact categories of of housing energy use plus transportation because it tends to be infill plus stuff because you can only put so much stuff in these small houses plus this really important equity issue um, both in terms of income and intergenerational which is where AARP really came into play you know they really see the advantages of this from a from an intergenerational equity um, perspective and meeting the housing needs of an aging population thank you so Tom and then Vanessa, and then we'll move toward the plenary. Well, I, I, I know I speak for a lot of Oregonians because I interview a lot of Oregonians that we really love these guys and what they represent. Uh, I want to make two quick points for your reaction. Uh, babe, you didn't mention the city of Eugene adopting a carbon neutral or, uh, ordinance to be met by the city operations in 2020 and a 2030 goal of substantially reducing the city, uh, uh, whole city population reductions in carbon emissions. And this is what I kind of characterize as a middle out of strategy. In fact, I would say everything you've talked about is what I would call middle out, and we talk so much about bottom up and top down, and this is sort of middle management out. And so that's one, the, 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 the ordinance. Uh, and I think I had another one, and now I've dropped it. but. This idea of working in this arena and moving out, I just, and maybe you want to talk about that ordinance and the adopting it, that where, I, as you noted, uh, having population support for this idea of using less, I've understood that gave the uh, policymakers that voted for that ordinance the political cover to say we can do this, and then absolutely no 
adverse public reaction when they adopted that ordinance within the city. Thank you. Sure, no, you raise a, a good case in point, Tom. So Tom's referring to something called the Climate Recovery Ordinance that our city council adopted in July of this year. And uh, that, that ordinance was originally uh, proposed by a nonprofit organization here in town called Our Children's Trust. Um, they've been involved in um, atmospheric trust litigation, if any of you have been tracing that. Um, but this was a campaign where they were working with Eugene first to see if they could help influence um, city level commitment to um, reaching our climate action goals. And what's important about this ordinance is um, we, we put into city code what we had as pre-existing goals for the city, and Tom mentioned those. We have one that calls for our city operations to be carbon neutral by 2020 and a second goal that we had already, that our city council had already adopted, which was to reduce our um, fossil fuel use as a community by 50% by the year 2030. So those goals were on the books. They'd been adopted by our city council, but they didn't have the force of law. And what changed with this ordinance is that it put them into city code. So um, it, it um, ratchets up the level of commitment, the level of accountability, um, potential exposure. <laughs> all those things. So um, we're just now starting to see a sea change um, politically as a result of that. Um, I think it's, it's critical that this change came from a community organization. It wasn't staff driven, though we helped to work on it. It was a, an outside community organization that really pushed our city council this way. And it was passed on a six to two vote. And we're already um, seeing some significant change in the conversations internally about how we're gonna meet these requirements. When the goals were just adopted goals and more advisory, uh, we had trouble getting airtime within our, um, within the city government, either with our management or with our city council. That's not true anymore. We're getting a lot of airtime and um, it gives us a great opportunity to bring consumption into the discussion because we're gonna have to uh, retool a lot of the analysis that supports how we get to those goals, and we definitely want to fold consumption into that work. Thank you. And another response before we move to the large group discussion. Hi, Vanessa Timmer from One Earth. And again, I agree that the presentation has been excellent. And um, I just wanted to pick up on, babe, what you were saying around the concern around um, reducing consumption and affecting economic development. And David, you mentioned this in terms of antagonizing a business, and I'm sure, Lauren, you've had this in Portland. Just wondered about this, um, how you're framing uh, a new economic development model as we're trying to unpack the sustainable consumption. So how these things are actually, or, you know, sustainable consumption um, approaches might require us to revisit what we mean by economic development within cities. We're just starting that conversation, and you'll hear some of it tomorrow in the fishbowl, because uh, we've invited in a number of Eugene community leaders um, that will be speaking to those points. So we're, we're just starting to explore. What I can suggest is just my own thinking on this at this point, and that is um, to really try and reframe the conversation around specific economic opportunities that are reflected in more sustainable consumption. So things like the remanufacturing industry. If we need industry jobs, let's do it around remanufacturing. Um, I think there's lots of other business opportunities, you know, that we could talk about this in more detail, but um, there's no reason why these market shifts can't be portrayed as a positive new direction, and that's what business is supposed to do, right? They're supposed to innovate take advantage of new market trends, listen to their consumer. Well, we're just helping to get that consumer voice and some of those shifts in, in consumption patterns in front of business, in front of local business. And that would be my perspective, is, is that it's, it's our job to help with that market research to drive that kind of innovative economic development. Um, in addition to the idea of new economic opportunities and the, the jobs potential, because there, there will be jobs here, um, I'll just mention that it, one effort at the state level to reframe the discussion around economic development. Um, in uh, December 1st, our governor, when he releases the state's budget, will also release a, a time series uh, from 1960 to 2013 of the state's genuine progress indicator, 
um, a measure of the state's economic activity with economic bads subtracted out and economic non-quantified goods added in. And um, our Department of Administrative Services and the Budget Office has indicated that after that's released, they're going to start working with state agencies. Um, and the, the challenge to the agencies will be, okay, as you develop your agency budgets, including around economic development, you need to demonstrate how your proposed work will contribute to the state's GPI. And that's gonna have to start for a few years at sort of the pilot scale because all the agencies are gonna go, whoa, how do we do that? So what is the GPI? There'll be a learning curve, but there is an, a, there is an attempt at that level to reframe the discussion from gross state product to what's the economy for anyways. One thing that I think that we're um, really going to need to do well is get our relationships in line really quickly around equity if we're talking about economy. Um, and um, we're really, uh, you know, Babe has talked about um, Airbnb and, B and um, Uber and, and those regulatory problems, but we're also really finding that it's complex when you get into the equity piece. And um, it, you're talking about restructuring our economy if the equity piece isn't at the table and part of that whole conversation as well, we're going to do it really wrong. And um, so we, and we're surprised that um, in, in Portland, as, as the Airbnb is, issue is um, finally coming into our community and we're talking about it there and figuring out how to, to walk that line, um, we're um, finding renters against renters on the conversation. Um, people feeling like rent is going way up because of it, but also people who have um, a rental space and want to share it uh, want to have that right as much as an owner. Um, Multifamily renters want to rent as much as single family renters. Um, again, though, does that, um, we're hearing people say that, that they're concerned about um, fair housing and, and it, people who have Airbnb can choose whoever they want to live in their house where rent, uh, landlords can't discriminate. Um, so equity is, is going to be all over this conversation around economy uh, and change. And we need to be very much aligning our relationships quickly if we're going to um, move in this direction. Thank you. One final question will shift to large group. Neil Gornflow is shareable. And two quick comments. Um, Dave, you talked about small housing. The, some of the most popular stories on shareable right now are about tiny houses. Um, and, and to add to your sort of um, list of reasons why it's uh, kind of an interesting and impactful idea is that uh, people typically, uh, proponents typically point to that the increasing quality of life, uh, especially um, the lessened financial burden and the increased amount of time that people can spend on the things they want to spend them on. And then there's a, a, an interesting story on the front page of Shareable um, about uh, a good analysis linking um, climate action work with equity, that they're one and the same and that we have to work on them together. So it's the same, it kind of this two sides of the same problem. Thank you. We're gonna shift to a large group discussion, a little bit experimental here.